Case at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. A San Antonio couple knows all too well the pain that Uvalde families are facing right now. Yeah, Sandy and Lonnie Phillips lost their daughter Jessica in a mass shooting at a movie theater in Aurora, Colorado almost 10 years ago, believe it or not. Since then, they have made it their mission to help other families who lose loved ones in mass shootings. Our Sarah Costa spoke with the Phillipses after they drove for the most recent mass shooting in Buffalo, New York, all the way to Uvalde to help grieving families there. San Antonio native Jessica Gowie was 24 years old when she was shot and killed in the Aurora Theater mass shooting in 2012. She was an aspiring sports reporter and even interned in some San Antonio newsrooms. Her mother, Sandy Phillips, recalls the last time she spoke with her daughter, who was living in Colorado as she started her journalism career. And she said, go back to bed, mom, get some rest. I need my mama. And I wrote back, I need my baby girl. And that was our last text. Lonnie Phillips heard his wife's screams from that phone call. And that's when I, I knew my wife would never be the same and I didn't have a daughter anymore. After their daughter's horrific death, they chose to turn their pain into purpose. They packed their life into a RV and travel from one mass shooting to another. Now their mission is to console and guide families through heartbreak using resources from their nonprofit, Survivors Empowered. If you head to survivorsempowered.org, you'll find an online toolkit that has information on how to navigate emotional trauma, raise money, and even handle lawsuits. Two days after the shooting at Robb Elementary, they left Buffalo, New York, and headed to Uvalde. They are spending a week there, passing out those guidebooks to families of victims. One of their biggest messages to families, you will survive, but the grief never leaves you. You don't get over it. It morphs, it changes, but you never get over it. And sometimes it gives you purpose, like it has given them. But you never forget your child. She left for college and went to Colorado. A uh, picture of us saying goodbye. I still cry. That's how long it lasts. It's been a decade. I can't hold back. Sarah Costa. KSAT 12 News. A San Antonio woman is making sure the faces and words of the children killed in Uvalde are not forgotten. In front of her northwest side home, Mary Moreno has placed a cardboard cutout of every child killed, each with a quote. Moreno hoping the words of the children from last week's tragedy will be enough to inspire change. To the children, I would tell them, you did not die in vain. You had nothing to do with this, but you did not die in vain. Moreno says the memorial took about three days to set up. She plans to keep it displayed until all of the funeral services have finished. San Antonio nonprofits also stepping up to help the town of Vivaldi. The San Antonio Food Bank regularly provides food to that area, but now there's a chance for folks to add a personal touch to the distribution. Camilla Juarez shows us how. When times of crisis, a neighbor might bring a casserole, right? You know, that's a little bit of the love that the food bank was trying to bring to the community of Uvalde. Like most nonprofit organizations, San Antonio Food Bank CEO Eric Cooper says they rushed to offer their support by giving hot ready meals to the social workers and counselors who are providing mental health services at the Civic Center in Uvalde. Humbly, we wanted to serve, we wanted to make a difference. Everybody has a role to play and definitely wanted to work behind the scenes and just to make sure that you know those families know that we're here for them. SA Food Bank is offering an opportunity for folks to make their standard food drop-offs a reminder that Uvalde is still in the community's prayers. In some ways that's unity, it's healing, there's an opportunity to be together and share, but as we prepare for our distributions in Uvalde uh, for the upcoming weeks, it's been great to see um, people coming out and volunteer. Volunteers are welcome to build care packages and write cards next Monday, June 6th. There are three shifts in the morning, afternoon, and evening. And for more information, you can go to SA Food Bank forward slash service day for Uvalde. Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. It's a legislative body marked by years of inaction on gun safety measures. The Uvalde School Massacre, the latest reminder that the United States Congress remains gridlocked on the issue. Our Dylan Collier took a closer look at what role federal lawmakers from Texas and specifically right here in the San Antonio area have played in that logjam. 
Just days after 19 children and two of their teachers were gunned down inside a classroom at Uvalde's Robb Elementary School, Texas Senator Ted Cruz took the stage at the National Rifle Association's annual conference just hundreds of miles away and left no doubt that despite the tragedy, his views on gun control are unchanged. It's a lot easier to moralize about guns and to shriek about those you disagree with politically. But it's never been about guns. Cruz and fellow Texas Republican Senator John Cornyn are part of the 100 person body that didn't take up a single piece of major gun violence prevention legislation all of last year and so far this year. Cornyn at a ceremony this afternoon in San Antonio to honor students headed to the U.S. service academies said a framework could be in place as soon as tomorrow on how the Senate will move forward on gun debate. This is a, uh, a sign to us that we need to do a lot more than we have done in the past. In the U.S. House of Representatives, San Antonio's congressional delegation was split last year on a pair of gun bills to bolster background checks. House Bill 8, or the Bipartisan Background Checks Act of 2021, received yay votes from Democratic Representatives Joaquin Castro and Lloyd Doggett. Republican Representatives Chip Roy and Tony Gonzalez voted nay. House Bill 1446, the Enhanced Background Checks Act of 2021, shook out the same way voting-wise. And although both measures passed the House, nearly 15 months later, they have not been brought to the Senate floor. There is a plague, a plague upon this nation. Gonzalez expanded on his nays on Twitter the day he voted down the measures, calling them gun grabs from the far left and in a separate tweet last June, said the far left will never stop trying to take Americans' guns. The first term Representative Gonzalez has been making the media rounds since the deadly shooting in Uvalde and said the issue that Americans should be looking at is mental health. He did not respond to a request from the defenders seeking comment today for this story. For the defenders, Dylan Collier, Case at 12 News. Dylan, thank you. A Bear County Sheriff's deputy has lost his job and is now facing some serious charges. 21-year-old Colby Counts Ramirez was arrested after allegedly attempting to smuggle marijuana into the Bear County Jail. According to Sheriff Javier Salazar, an inmate was heard speaking in code during a phone call. That led deputies to discover an operation to smuggle those drugs into the jail. Marijuana and synthetic marijuana was found in Counts Ramirez's car outside of the jail. He's now facing charges of criminal conspiracy to commit substances into a correctional facility, possession of a controlled substance, and possession of marijuana. San Antonio police looking for a driver responsible for a hit and run accident around midnight over on the east side. It happened in the 900 block of Gembler Road. According to SAPD, a man and woman were riding their motorcycle when a vehicle passed a parked bus and traveled into their lane with oncoming traffic. The vehicle almost hitting the motorist head on, causing the motorcycle to crash. The man on the motorcycle broke his ankle. The woman also injured. Both were taken to nearby hospitals. The driver of that vehicle has not been found. San Antonio police are asking for information regarding an unsolved murder from two years ago. According to San Antonio police, 48 year old Charles Pryor was outside of his home in the 3400 block of Action Lane. Around 915 PM, a vehicle with several people inside pulled up and began shooting. Pryor was found dead outside of his home. Anyone with information can call Crime Stoppers at 214-210-224 STOP. Let's take a quick look at time saver traffic. Most people are off today, so we don't expect to see much out there. And that is the case at US 281 in Grayson. As folks are heading into downtown or out of downtown on their way to perhaps a picnic this evening. Hot one out there for a picnic, Adam. Oh yeah, the summer like heat, it continues. You can see a lot of sunshine, some fair weather clouds out there and a fairly muggy as well, the humidity. Take a look at our almanac data today, 96, the high temperature. That's just two degrees shy of the record. 98 set back in 2003. Right now we're at 95 degrees by eight o'clock, right near 90, 10 o'clock, 83. Temperatures will fall down into the 70s this, this evening, but it's going to be windy. You'll notice those gusty winds. We're going to talk more about the wind, how that changes in the days ahead, along with a little slight chance of rain and the latest on Hurricane Agathon, where its remnants go in the Gulf coming right up.
Well, it is a holiday that's associated with family time, barbecues, and the unofficial kickoff of summer. But for military families especially, it carries a deeper meaning. Yeah, it is a day to remember those who gave their lives in military service. Garen Berger talked with some San Antonians about how they are marking this Memorial Day. It's a perfect spring day in Brackenridge Park. Pretty cloudy day, not sunny and hot, nice and cool. And for Minor Ramirez and his family, a perfect opportunity to get together. The children just kind of run around, jumping around on the trees and playing, things like that. Nearby, high school teacher Sarai Kamisi and her husband enjoyed the extra day off before she returns to a longer run of school than she's used to. More extending it and a, a coming three weeks of summer school, which I never had. <laughs> to do. But she says she's also reflecting on the loss of people who served, something that hits home for many here in Military City, USA. At the oldest VFW post in Texas, Post 76 and Grunt Style put on an event with a remembrance at the very forefront. But this event in particular is surrounded by um, all veterans, combat veterans, um, and, and our civilian community to celebrate their Sorry. service. Del Castillo, Dimitri, Alejandro Army. A video played in the background, a reading of the names of those who died in Iraq and Afghanistan. Outside the post, dog tags and candles. But there was still food, drinks, and a dance floor for later. I think really there's no proper way, right? It's how you choose to do it, right? I choose to, to celebrate and have a lot of a good time because I know that my friends are looking down on me and I, I live my best for those, those, those gentlemen that are not with me today. Gone in body, not in spirit. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. And we thank all those families for their massive sacrifice. Coming up, a cure for type 1 diabetes could be on the horizon, and it's being developed right here in Texas. More details after the break. As 19 children and two teachers are laid to rest this week, the world is trying to make sense of what happened at Robb Elementary. I'm Lee Waldman. Tonight on The Night Beat, we'll show you how people are coming together. Well, as you know, San Antonio is known as Military City USA, but in the medical world, it's also known as a diabetes hotspot. Yeah, 1.6 million Americans are living with type 1 diabetes, an autoimmune disease that causes the pancreas to stop producing insulin. Our Ursula Perry reports type 1 diabetes has no cure, only treatments, but that could change for good soon, thanks to research in Houston. Sydney Stevens is a busy 12 year old. This one's for gymnastics, this one's for swimming. She does 16 hours of gymnastics, she does five hours of volleyball, she does four hours of track and field, and four hours of lacrosse, and then an hour of swim. She does all of this while managing type 1 diabetes. This one is my pump, it gives me insulin when I'm high. Sydney monitors her glucose levels with her smartphone, and now bioengineers at Rice University are working on a new implant that would replace those monitors. We hope that we could have the body uh, regulate its own blood glucose. In type 1 diabetes, a person's own immune system attacks and kills insulin producing beta cells within the pancreas. So now researchers are growing beta stem cells in the lab. We want to now use these cells combine them with innovative tissue engineering strategies that protect them from the host immune system. This 3D printed hydrogel scaffold protects the cells that are implanted in a patient's stomach area. This mesh keeps the immune cells out and at the same time nutrients and oxygen as well as the insulin can diffuse in and out of these biomaterial constructs. Allowing the body to create and regulate its own insulin. My hope about diabetes is, even if there isn't a cure, that the technology gets better every year. The researchers at Rice University say that each implant would contain a half a billion beta cells. That's how many we are born with, but in type 1 diabetes, they're all destroyed. The researchers say that right now, these implants are being tested on mice, but they're hoping to move on to human trials in the next few years. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. If you're having a picnic today, you need to really hold down the paper plates, the napkins, yes. the tablecloth. Everything's blown. Your fan, out there. your fan might blow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, that's the case. It was yesterday, too, if you have an awning out mm -hmm. or one of those tents popped up. Those are notorious for uh, getting carried away. And you have to anchor everything down out there. And tomorrow is going to be similar in terms of the noticeable wind. Of course, we're looking for some rain. And we'll jump into temperatures in a moment. I want to talk about rainfall first. And so far this month of May, we've had under an inch of rain officially at the airport. Point eight six. That's about three and a half inches below average and year to date. We've had about four and a half inches, which is more than eight inches below average. We're on the lookout for some moisture. Uh, obviously, today's not our day. That's for sure. We had the low clouds this morning, but they're not the type that really make any showers or thunderstorms. A lot of sunshine this afternoon. The real action that's up in the northern tier of the country, especially from uh, roughly Utah, Colorado, particularly through the Dakotas up into Minnesota. That's where the severe weather is even stretching from central Minnesota all the way down into Kansas, all the way down toward Wichita area and just cutting off there at the Oklahoma border. We're close to the big blue H upper level high that's pressing down on us and preventing any showers or storms from forming. And one thing we look at now this time of year is the tropics and those tropical systems are always loaded with moisture and they can really provide drought relief to a good portion of the US, the Gulf Coast, all the way up and down the East Coast as well. We have Hurricane Agatha right now, and this is moving into southern Mexico, moving to the northeast at eight miles per hour, making landfall uh, basically momentarily. And it's going to get ripped apart a bit in the higher terrain here. But as we go later into the week, the remnants of it are likely to emerge into the Gulf of Mexico, into the southern Gulf, and then head toward Florida. Unfortunately, we're not going to tap into any of this moisture. At least that's the way it looks right now. There's Thursday afternoon, the remnants of it near the Yucatan Peninsula, but it's throwing a lot of rain out over the Gulf, Cuba, and then even on into Florida late this week and on into the upcoming weekend. Basically, it's going to emerge into the Gulf as a big rain making system, but making that rain a little too far away from us for us to get any relief from our drought. So unfortunately, it's just not in the works this time around. It's not our turn, not meant to be a 10% chance of a few pop up afternoon showers or storms. Wednesday and Thursday. That's it. Otherwise, more of the same summer like conditions. 95 right now feels like 97 when you factor in the dew point, the humidity out there. Dew point 64, relative humidity 36%. So it feels like it's two degrees warmer than the air temperature. And the wind has been noticeable. We're looking at gusts right now between 20 and 30. 20 and 30 miles per hour for the most part. New Braunfels, a recent gust up to 32. And this wind is stout out of the southeast coming off the Gulf of Mexico. I think it's going to persist for a good portion of the night and then throughout the day tomorrow. Here's our wind gust forecast tomorrow. Again, gusting up to about 25 miles per hour, but then the wind slackens a bit by Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Uh, basically after tomorrow, you're not going to notice as much of a wind. All right, temperatures quickly 90s for most of Texas now 97 Midland Lubbock right now at 95 Kerrville 92 98 in Catula Eagle Pass at 99. Meanwhile, Bulverde and even 90 degrees and as your case at 12 hour forecast shows 76 tomorrow morning with low gray clouds, maybe a stray sprinkle, but insignificant, not a big deal by noon near 90 and then into the afternoon, a good amount of sunshine 97 for the afternoon high. Obviously, the typically warmer spots will be a little bit warmer. For example, Divine about 98 tomorrow and Castroville 98. And then we're into the upper 90s right near 100 this upcoming weekend. 98, 99, pretty close to the century mark there. Yep. Well, we've been there already, so I guess it was like training. <laughs> yes. Practice for the practice. real thing. Yeah. All right, Greg, the Roadrunners baseball team put together an impressive uh, resume this year, but not enough for some. Yeah, for whatever reason, those that were selecting the process today for the tournament for the NCAA left off the UTSA Run Runners despite their incredible performances here. When we come back, we'll let you know why we think they were snubbed and a San Antonio resident almost wins the Indy 500 <laughs> coming up. The UTSA Roadrunners baseball season has come to an end after they were left out of the 64 team field of the NCAA tournament today. After Sunday's dramatic nine day loss to Louisiana Tech in the Conference USA title game, the Roadrunners had gathered at the University Race Facility today to watch the selection show, only to find out they've been left out. Despite the fact they had a 38 win season, including victories over 11 ranked teams, including number two Stanford. But apparently it wasn't enough. And to make matters worse, they were not even in the top four of the teams that missed out. Disappointing, to say the least. Meantime, the Texas 
Texas State Bobcats, who won the Sun Belt Conference title, received a bid to play in Stanford Regional today. That's where they will face the University of California at Santa Barbara Friday at 8 p.m. Meantime, the Texas Longhorns will be hosting one of the NCAA regionals. That's after they were seated number nine overall. And their first opponent will be the Air Force Falcons, who they're very familiar with. The two teams split a series in Austin back in April, losing to Air Force in game one, 14 to two, but winning game two, 12 to 10. The Longhorns and Falcons batter up on Friday at Dishfalk Field at 1 p.m. The state softball field has been set. The O'Connor Panthers will return to Red and Charlene McCombs Field in Austin for the sixth time in program history. And for the first time since 2012, the Panthers swept Westlaco in the UIL Class 6A regional final over the weekend, 5-1 to one and 7-6. to six. They punched their tickets to the state thanks to a clutch double play that ended a seventh-inning Westlaco rally. O'Connor has yet to lose a playoff game this season. They've outscored their opponents 68-19. to 19. So 30-1 and one O'Connor will face El Paso Americas in the Class 6A state semifinals this Friday at 4 p.m. The Trailblazers are 35 and 6 and in the class 1A, DeHannis returns to the state semifinals for the fourth time in the last five years. They will face Dodge City on Tuesday at 1 p.m. This is a rematch of last year's state title game. Congratulations San Antonio's own Pato Award, who almost won his first ever Indianapolis 500. That's after he battled all day long with Scott Dixon for the lead at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. But Dixon made a critical error when he was flagged for breaking the speed limit on Pitt Road, had to pay the price with a pass-through penalty. Then Jimmy Johnson wrecks out, forcing a red flag that placed Pato right behind Marcus Erickson with just four laps to go. Award would give it his best shot on the sprint to the finish line, but Erickson did a great job of blocking to take the checkered flag, and Award will wind up with a second-place finish. They had the faster car. We need to do a better job. We need to, to come back next year and, and uh, give it hell again. But I'm proud of the job that we did today. Uh, it's my, my best result in the 500. It's just a, a, you know, it's a, a, a bit of a tough pill to swallow after just such a long race and um, you know, doing everything correctly. Into Sean Elliott. He fires the three. It never gets old. It's almost 23 years ago to the day when Sean Elliott hit the biggest shot in franchise history. We delivered the Memorial Day miracle in Game 2 of the Western Conference Finals against the Portland Trailblazers to help propel the Spurs to the first of five NBA titles. And what made it so remarkable, had Sean not lifted his heels off the floor to make this shot in the corner, he would have been out of bounds. That's how close it was. Incredible. Look at that right there. He leaves on his tippy toes. That's the only way he made that shot not be out of bounds. And the rest is history. It sure is. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> Got it. Great memory. Coming up after the break, zebra mussels have been an issue for Texas lakes for many years now. So how were biologists able to remove them after being discovered at a, in a lake in Waco? Those answers coming up next in a new Case That Explains. Well, a lot of people will be packing local lakes today and throughout the whole summer to have fun and stay cool. But there's a problem in the water, zebra mussels. You might have heard about this invasive species. Once they're found in the water, it's nearly impossible to get rid of them. Yeah, and they can cause some serious issues for boaters and infrastructure. But a lake up in Waco did eradicate zebra mussels. It was a long shot, but it worked. In this week's Case That Explains, David Sears and Myra Arthur find out how and whether a solution like that could work for our local lakes here at home. There's just like fire ants or, you know, they just come and, and you, you really can't get rid of them. They just accumulate in these big clumps. You literally have millions, if not billions of them out there. There's really nothing that can be done to eradicate them. There they are. There you go. Zebra mussels were found in Canyon Lake in 2017. A scuba diving type survey done at Canyon Lake, and they didn't find any adult zebra mussels, right? And 2017 was when it was infested. It happens fast, and boats are to blame. The mussels attach themselves to boats and hang on to those that are not drained and dried. Essentially, they hitch a ride from lake to lake. 
28 Texas lakes are considered infested with zebra mussels, which means they're there and reproducing. When they grow, they clog up pipes, they get all over boats. Um, they just basically destroy infrastructure. And that's a huge problem for places like Canyon Lake, where this is the community's water source. Look how the mussels clogged this water intake pipe belonging to Canyon Lake Water Service Company in 2019. The infestation choked off the water supply, dropping it by 50%. The fact is that they can smother things, anything that's in uh, the water. It's just spotting these. Ironically, smothering is exactly the strategy that got rid of zebra mussels in Waco. Really didn't have much chance to succeed when we, when we did it, but we thought, why not? The mussels were found in Lake Waco in 2014. They fell off of a barge that Tib says was put in the water despite showing obvious signs of the creatures. They knew the threat of zebra mussels, which is why just weeks before they were discovered here in Waco, Parks and Wildlife actually trained city staff on how to spot them, and that's how they were found. A lone pair of eyes saw the mussels in the water, and that kicked off this whole experiment. We defined an area, and um, the decision was made to put tarps all over the bottom of the, of the lake here to smother out the zebra mussels. Uh, they require oxygen to live, they require food to be taken from the water, and so if they were smashed to the bottom of the lake, they're not going to be able to do any of that. The mussels were found right at the shoreline. An area of the lake about the size of a football field was covered in tarps held down by sandbags. It was a Waco City employee's idea. We gave it kind of out of a 10% chance of success, but it was the city's money, so we helped. <laughs> and uh, he was right. It worked. Six months later, they pulled up the tarps and found one zebra mussel. And now years later, they've yet to find any more. How do they describe the success? Lucky. <laughs> that would be one word I would use. Here's why. The mussels at Lake Waco were caught early. There were only about 75 of them at the time, all adults, and they hadn't reproduced yet. It was caught just in the nick of time for that technique to work. Most often, by the time the mussels are discovered, there are far too many to control. That's the case in both Canyon and Medina Lakes. Chemical removal of the mussels would have a negative effect on the environment, potentially killing off other wildlife. Not to mention... It's going to be hugely expensive, a lake of this size, uh, to put chemicals in there. Um, it, so not only is it environmentally damaging, um, it'll be very expensive. So on lakes like Canyon and Medina, it's about learning to live with them. Mother Nature helps out somewhat on Medina Lake where the water level is low, down 57 feet. In areas where the water dries up, the mussels will die. The lake level going up and down like that certainly could uh, aid in slowing the population and maybe they won't reach in a variable level lake. They may not reach the just massively high infestation levels that we see on lakes like Travis and Canyon. At Canyon Lake, changes had to be made to deal with the infestation. Canyon Lake Water Service Company enlarged its infrastructure, making it big enough for divers to do inspections and remove any mussels they find. And now we actually have a brush that goes down into the casing and will clean out all of the debris or any kind of zebra mussels and push them out back into the lake. You got one of those bottle cleaners. Huh? It is a giant <laughs> bottle cleaner on a drill and it just goes all the way down. Canyon Lake Water also changed up the screens on the water intakes, moving to copper, a material the zebra mussels don't like to stick to. But the biggest solution... Clean, drain, and dry. Clean, drain, dry. Clean, drain, and dry their boats. Must come from boaters. The important thing is that when you come out of a lake, you know, check your boat over. Particularly if it's in a, a, a slip and it's been in there a long time, you really need to clean it. Drain all the water from every compartment, raise and lower the motor, get all the water out of that. And then when you get home, open everything up and let everything dry out, preferably for a week. And that's for lakes in general. When you know that it's a zebra mussel infect infested lake like this one, that makes it even much more important to make sure that uh, there's no water on board. That way these critters can't stay on board either. Zebra mussels are native to parts of Europe and Asia, the Balkan Peninsula, and Poland. 
here in Texas. Having or transporting zebra mussels is illegal and can earn you a $500 fine. You can catch any episode of KSAT Demands or KSAT Explains On Demand. Just scan this QR code you see there on your screen and it'll take you right to KSAT.com slash explains and look for a brand new episode next Monday on the news at six. They are demanding that you clean, drain, dry. Yes. <laughs> Still ahead, a public Memorial Day ceremony was held at Fort Sam Houston for the first time since the start of the pandemic. We'll take a look after the break. Hundreds of people gathered at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery today to honor the men and women who lost their lives defending our nation. People traveling from across the country for the first public Memorial Day ceremony at the cemetery since 2019 after it was canceled due to COVID-19. Tiffany Huertas has a look at the solemn services. A day to honor and remember the fallen heroes who died while serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. The ceremony at Fort Sam Houston National Cemetery was filled with military traditions. I'm a veteran, so it, it's always been in my heart. And I take it very seriously. And um, I come every year since I've been out, I come every year and come visit my uncle. And um, I just appreciate for what they did for us, the fallen soldiers, and I think it's very important that we honor them. Due to COVID-19, the public ceremony was last held in 2019. Memorial Day is not just for veterans who may have fallen during the war, but also those who may have been wounded during the war, but survived for another two years, and then they were, they were interred here in the cemetery. Because the first time we did this was back in 2010, and we read the names of over 76,000 veterans. During this morning ceremony, they also remembered the 21 lives lost in Uvalde. I just wanted to, to take a moment to acknowledge that, and I know it's, it's in the minds and the hearts of many of you uh, this morning, uh, as it is in my heart and in my mind. Also back this year, the tradition of placing flags at each grave. Volunteers with the nonprofit Flags for Fallen Vets placed them yesterday. I'm fortunate enough to be able to go see my father and one of my younger brothers. They're buried here at the same gravestone with my mother. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Taking a live look outside. It, I mean, it even looks hot out there. I mean, <laughs> like, I don't know. I feel like you can see it. Maybe it's because I've been out there today. Not as hot as it's been, but it's still yeah. hot. Yeah. It's yep. summer in South Texas almost. And we had, you know, so many record high temperatures this month. We'll take a look at the breakdown coming up in a little bit and how this month is going to go down in the record books. But let's start with this evening. 95 right now. Wind out of the southeast at 21 miles per hour. So you're noticing that breeze and it's going to persist through the night and even during the day tomorrow. Near 90 at 8 o'clock, by midnight, we'll dip down into the upper 70s, starting the day tomorrow in the mid-70s. We'll talk more about temperatures and how they do change into the upcoming weekend, along if there's any glimmer of hope for rain coming up. In the buzz tonight, Netflix's newest special honors a well-known comedian who passed away last year. The streaming network released Norm MacDonald Nothing Special today. McDonald wrote and performed the one man comedy show at home alone before his death back in September. McDonald had been battling cancer for several years and was ill at the time of the show's filming, but he got through it in a single take. The special includes McDonald's performance along with the half hour discussion between a group of comedy heavy hitters, including Dave Chappelle, David Letterman, Adam Sandler, David Spade, Conan O'Brien and Molly Shannon. Well, people in North America could see a dazzling display in the sky tonight. The Earth is expected to pass through the debris trail of a broken comet tonight into tomorrow. NASA says the best time to check it out on the East Coast will be around 1 a.m. and 10 p.m. on the West Coast. The Space Agency says the meteor shower was first discovered in 1930, but scientists say it has been breaking apart for decades. 
So there is a chance you won't see much. And another reason you won't see much probably is because we tend to get those clouds yeah. overnight. Right, Adam? Yeah, we do. And they move in pretty quickly in this type of weather pattern where you have that stiff wind off the Gulf of Mexico. And the, those low clouds usually start settling in around 10, 11 p.m. So it can be uh, pretty difficult for our viewing around here. All right, let's talk about temperatures the rest of this week. Well into the 90s, 97 tomorrow, 96 Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And yeah, temperatures change this weekend, but it only gets a little hotter. We're talking about 99, the high temperature this weekend and by this time next week. So a little closer to the century mark there. And let's put this month of May into perspective. Of course, tomorrow's the last day of May and we are on track to have the hottest May on record here in San Antonio. Right now we're about six and a half degrees above average. And we've had, let's see, what, seven, eight record high temperatures today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, eight record high temperatures this month. That's what we've had. And the average temperature throughout the month, obviously, as I mentioned, well above average and on track to be the warmest May on record, which goes back to 1885, by the way. Big Blue H, upper level high close to us. That's giving us our sunshine again this afternoon. The activity, the real moisture in the action is in the northern United States here from parts of the Inner Mountain West, Montana, Wyoming, all the way into the Dakotas and Minnesota. And the severe weather threat stretches down into parts of eastern Kansas. That's where the moisture is. It's just not here and it's not headed our way. That's moving away from us. We often look to the tropics as we get into this time of year. June 1st, the official start to the Atlantic hurricane season. But we have a Pacific system right now. Hurricane Agatha, max sustained winds about 80 miles per hour now. It's coming to shore in far southern Mexico, and it will get ripped apart as it moves over land over the next couple of days and continue to weaken. It already has weakened a little bit as it's made itself on shore. But the remnants of it, there's still a lot of leftover moisture in the atmosphere. So even though it weakens, there's still a lot of rain that's going to be moving toward the Yucatan Peninsula, Gulf of Mexico area, Southern Gulf, and it's looking like it should be a good rainmaker, widespread soaking rain. But here's San Antonio. There's the rain too far away from us. It's likely to head toward from the Yucatan Peninsula through parts of western Cuba on into Florida. That would be a real drought denting kind of rainfall for us. It's just not our turn this time of round. And of, and of course, we'll be watching it to see if it does develop into an actual tropical cyclone over the Gulf of Mexico. But right now, it just looks like it'd be a big rainmaker for parts of Florida toward the end of next week. Our rain chances, 10%. That's Wednesday and Thursday afternoons. We could have a few rogue pop up showers and storms, especially closer to the Gulf Coast, but I think predominantly dry and hot 95 right now. Remember the average high this time of year is 90 degrees. Today we made it to 96. Right now we're at 95 dew point of 64. It feels like we're two degrees warmer than the air temperature. We're not seeing a big drop off in dew points this afternoon. Uh, generally in the mid 60s and even some upper 60s for dew points. It's that wind coming off the Gulf of Mexico, gusting up to 30 miles per hour. It's just really reinforcing that mugginess. Temperatures now 90s. Close to 100, Eagle Pass 99, Del Rio, Catula 98 degrees, 93 New Braunfels, south side of San, San Antonio Stinson Airport measuring 95. And by tomorrow morning, mid 70s, 76 and cloudy, and then partly cloudy into the afternoon, 97 the high temperature, and still windy. You're, you'll notice that wind through the night and even the day tomorrow. Closer to the century mark along the Rio Grande tomorrow, but most of us around San Antonio, about 97. This weekend, we're turning up the heat a little bit more. Looks like the upper 90s wouldn't surprise me if we hit 100. Going to be a long, hot summer. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Even though it was a holiday today, an awful lot was going on. Here's a look back in case you missed it. Roughly 39 million Americans traveling this Memorial Day weekend. Air travel at pre-pandemic levels during this unofficial kickoff to summer. Just kind of have an adventure after being uh, home for quite some time with the pandemic and all the restrictions. We are learning tonight that the city of Uvalde has decided to cancel the city council meeting that was scheduled for tomorrow. That meeting significant because it was when the Uvalde CISD police chief, Peter Arredondo, was supposed to be sworn in as a District 3 councilman. 
I mean, he was duly elected, and, it, and it'll, that's something Pete and, and I'm sure the people in his district will come to terms with. Mary Moreno is keeping the words of the 19 children whose lives were lost in the Valley Massacre alive and in front of her northwest side community's eyes. She's placed cardboard cutouts of kids in her front yard, each of them with a quote. Is there one that sticks out to you more than others? I'll play dead so I won't get shot. United States Senator John Cornyn hinting that the debate on gun reform could resume in the Senate among members of both parties at a ceremony in San Antonio honoring area students headed to the U.S. service academies. Cornyn said a framework could be in place as soon as tomorrow to pick up discussion on the Senate floor. The Senate did not take up a single piece of major gun violence prevention legislation all of that last year and this year. City officials say thousands have made it back to the Guadalupe and Comal rivers, helping stimulate the New Braunfels tourism industry and economy. Tourism is a major piece of our economy and it, it was tough not being able to welcome our guests. So we are so grateful to be able to do that again. <gasps> We hope you have a, oh, go ahead. Here's KSA 12 hour Just kidding. Forecast. That's what we've got right now. We have low clouds tomorrow morning. May, maybe a sprinkle or two. That would be it, an isolated sprinkle possible early in the morning. Otherwise, we're just looking at a lot of sunshine tomorrow, well into the 90s for high temperatures. Okay, I'm ready. We now. heard that part. Yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> it's hot, okay, that's it. And it's only getting hotter this week. That's all of our time. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you back here for the Night Beat tonight at 10. Have a safe rest of your Memorial Day.